Hey everyone, welcome back to AP Psychology with me, Ms. Baines, your teacher, as I roll out the content for our AP Psychology course for you for the very first time you ever see it or hear it. While I'm doing the talking, you should be filling up your binder notes with everything that I say. Make sure you write down everything. Don't rush through it and make sure you pause and rewind. If I'm talking, you should be listening and then write it down while it's paused. Rewind a little bit, write it down, and then you can move forward. Even if you think you know it already, trust me, by doing all of this work up front now, it'll pay off later when you have to apply what you've learned to the activities. Okay, so the extension of today's activity will be tomorrow, and a lot of the things that you were doing have names. So hopefully you will have watched this or Rochelle's video, and. You won't have to ask me anymore. Miss Baines, what is top-down or bottom-up learning? I was probably a little bit upset with you if you asked me this today because presumably you had already had the notes of part one. That's what our activity was based upon today. Okay, and now the day after tomorrow we'll be having a quiz which may or may not be open book this time. So I think you get my drift here. Today it's unit two. Don't forget to grab those ever so important binder notes that accompany today's video, which is Unit 3, Video 2, Introduction to Sensation and Perception, Part 2. I'll see you on the other side. Okie dokie, so welcome back. Let's continue our talk about introduction to sensation and perception. We talked about sensation in part one, so let's talk a little bit more about perception. So we're going to talk about a couple of different ways that we perceive things. Okay, let's talk about gestalt psychology. We talked a little bit about that when I introduced you to different um, schools of thought in our very first unit. Gestalt psychology helps us to organize information into meaningful wholes, okay? Remember, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. So the way that we take in information into our brain is stored in little filing cabinets up in our brain. And we're gonna talk more about that later but I just want you to know that the whole is different from the sum of its parts, right? How we make meaning out of things are a bunch of little context clues, and then we put them all together, and we form a common language, and then we have a shared experience of the way the world is perceived, okay? Um, so for example, the organization of the visual field here Right, we see a table and then we see a background and a figure ground. Okay, the figures that stand out from each other are these black forms making a little star shaped, but we know we have a desk or something behind it. Okay, so our brain fills in our context clues to know which thing is which. Gestalt groupings are really important also in terms of um, figures from foreground and background and our perception needs to organize and figure out meaningful forms using different grouping rules okay we have closure right we fill in the blanks on this one we have proximity when we have different columns of amounts we have continuation with the keys over here similarity with the filled in black dots and then the not filled in black dots and then connectedness, right, with this barbell. We know that if one is on one side, that the other one has to match. Okay, so the way we see things and the way we perceive them and put them together is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Once we have the picture in our mind of what we know to be true about whatever that picture is of say, I don't know, my dog, Right? If we have a picture of Lulu here, we know from a whole series of different experiences that I have had that this is my pet and I love my pet and she's so very, very cute. Okay, so just keep all these things in mind about the Gestalt principles as we go over each one of them individually. There's sort of a whole set that's behind the theory. Okay, so first up is the way that we visually perceive things. 
first way is called stroboscopic motion. This is our tendency to perceive motion when a series of still images are slightly buried and then flashed at you in rapid succession. This should be very familiar to you because this is how movies are made, or were made, especially animation. But all movies, for that matter, used to be made this way. You may have seen those, or maybe even made like a stick figure on a post-it pad and made a tiny little difference. And then when you flip through, it looks like the guy is falling down and then getting back up or picking something up, right? And it just one little motion takes three or four hundred little tiny stick figures. Okay, the next one is perception of movement known as the phi phenomenon. This is where lights are used to illustrate motion. We see this a lot in neon signs, right? This was really popular in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, but we also see it in Christmas lights, especially those that are displayed with music, right? It almost looks like the strobing of the lights are going to the rhythm of the music. Other types of perception that we have, or rules of perception, I should say, are things like perceptual constancy. So if we perceive events or objects, even if the illumination or the actual retinal image changes. So what I mean by that is when we see something, when we see something change shape, like let's say for example, a door as it's opening, right? When it's shut, it looks flat and one dimensional. When it opens, it looks three dimensional because we see another angle of it. But just because our eyes are sensing that change in shape doesn't mean that we perceive it as a different object altogether. We still know it's a door, and we still know it's the same door, and that it's the same size and the same shape. But from our past experiences, we know that it's different depending on how we look at it. So that's perceptual constancy. There are a couple of different types of perceptual constancy, including shape and size, which we're gonna go into. Our size constancy refers to our tendency to perceive objects as unchanging in size, even though our closeness or distance from the object may change. This is regardless of the stability size perception amid the changing size of the stimuli, even if we're in motion, say, on a boat or on a train or in a moving car or even walking. We can tell, for example, with this image of depth perception that even though these cars look like they are drawn right next to each other, because the one behind the red car, the blue one, looks like it's further away from us, even though we know legitimately that it was drawn onto the page right next to it. Okay, so that is what we mean by size constancy, and there are a few different types. One of the types that are really important is the size-distance relationship of the moon to the horizon or to, say, a haunted house, right? The moon illusion appears larger and further away when it's on the horizon and further and closer up when it's up in the night sky. Guess what? You better brace yourself because we don't really know why the moon has this illusion of being either small on the horizon or giant on the horizon. Well, not really, depending on your mindset. This news might be unsatisfying or it could be a reason to marvel at our mysterious brains. But despite the fact that people have been observing this illusion for thousands of years, we still don't have a rock-solid scientific explanation. In general, the proposed explanations have to do with a couple of key elements of how we visually perceive the world, how our brains perceive the size of objects that are either nearer or farther away, and how far away we expect objects to be when they're close to the horizon. So when the moon is up in the sky amongst the stars alone, of course we think it's just as small as a lot of the other things that we're looking at. It's bigger than a lot of the billions of light years away stars that we're looking at because it's closer to us in reality. But when we look at it on a horizon or above, say, a haunted house, it seems like it's sitting right on top of it. It seems our brains don't know that the moon's distance doesn't change that much, no matter where it is in the night, on any given night in the sky.
There's also some thinking that the objects in the foreground of your lunar view play a role. Perhaps the trees, mountains, and buildings help to trick your brain into thinking that the moon is both closer and bigger than it really is. What makes this happen? Well, cues to the objects, distances at the horizon make the moon behind them seem farther away than the moon in the night sky. There are various explanations, yet no one has the right, quote, correct answer. I will say, though, that a harvest moon is super orange and super giant, and it occurs somewhere around right now, around the time of autumn. And you'll see it around Halloween, where it looks like it's a big orange glowing plate in the sky. And if you look out into the distance, you'll see it almost as if it's on top of the trees and the houses around you. Okay, Next up, we have the size-distance relationship with the Ponzo illusion. When we use background objects to detect an object in the distance, for example, the yellow bar, that distant yellow bar appears bigger to us because of our depth cues. The size-distance relationship here in the mueller liar illusion is the fact that both of these lines are the same exact length, even though the arrows are pointing inward or outward it makes it appear as though the line on the left is longer, even though they're the same exact size. See that? The Ames Room is a really interesting concept. If you would like to hear more about that, stay tuned and I will play this little video for you. <laughs> Does what we see correspond to what's really out there? Or does our brain construct its own version of reality, one that does not always match up with the physical universe? Check me out, for example. I am the same size here as I am over here. But over here, I look much larger. No, it's not a cheap video trick. It's a trick on your brain. Here's what you're seeing. The me over here is indeed projecting a smaller image onto your retina, the region of light detecting cells at the back of your eye. All else being equal, smaller images mean smaller things. Here, I'm in no danger of hitting my head on the ceiling. But over here, I am ducking. Ceilings are useful visual landmarks for judging size. Of course, you're making these size estimates based on the assumption that this room is ordinary and box-shaped. You assume the back wall is perpendicular to the line of sight, so the two versions of me are the same distance away. You're also assuming that the floor and ceiling are level and parallel. But as you probably guessed, this isn't the case, and the room isn't box-shaped at all. It's trapezoidal. The back left corner of the room is much farther away than the right. Since I'm farther away over here, my image is smaller, although I'm definitely not. The ceiling cue is also misleading. The floor actually slants upward and the ceiling downward from left to right, making my head much closer to the ceiling when I'm over here. Why couldn't you see these things and adjust your size estimates? The room's features have been cleverly distorted to be consistent with a rectangular shape. The checkerboard pattern on the floor gets finer grain toward the right so that the same number of pattern elements fit in a shorter distance. The windows are resized and shaped to match the trapezoidal back wall. Your narrow angle of view from the front of the room blocks the cues that would reveal the room's true shape. And of course, we easily believe in a box shape because that's the shape rooms normally are. This clever setup is called the Ames Illusion. American ophthalmologist Adelbert Ames Jr. devised it in 1934 and built a physical example the following year. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Ingrid Wickelgren. Known as sensory deprivation, also known as perceptual isolation. So for example, if kittens were raised without the exposure to the horizontal lines, they would later have difficulty perceiving horizontal bars. It suggests that vision is at least partly an acquired sense, something that we learn 
as we experience the world around us. Not everything is innately built into us. Because all mammals have similar experiences in terms of the way that the sensory information is stimulated into our five senses and then we make perception out of it through our brain once the signal gets there. Perceptual adaptation is the visual ability to adjust to an artificially displaced visual field. For example, the drunk goggles or the upside down occipital lobe goggles that you guys used in our lab. Or maybe if you're taking driving lessons, they have you use these in driving school. We humans can adapt even to those upside down worlds if we were to wear them long enough. Okay, so when you were throwing the balls into the basket or trying to pin the tail on the donkey, you only had a few minutes to try to adjust your eyes to that. If you had, say, I don't know, an entire week for each to figure out where the world was perceptually, you would figure out how to adjust yourself in order to get around in a world like that. The same way a completely blind person is able to get around through the use of their ears and using a tapping a stick in front of them to make sense of where the edges of the world are. Okay? A perceptual set then is the mental predisposition to perceive one thing and not another. It's a tendency to perceive or notice certain aspects of the available sensory data, but ignore the others. That's why some people see one thing and other people see something else. We did this with our mice and man lab, right? Some of you, when you were primed to see a whole bunch of pictures of people's faces, you saw the man. Some of you then, when you saw all the pictures of the rodents, you saw the illustration, even though it was the same, you saw it as a mouse. What do you see in the center picture is influenced by the flanking pictures. Okay, so because there is a duck and a rabbit on either side, depending on which one you looked at first is going to determine what you see in the center photo. Which did you see? A rabbit or a duck? How is top-down processing involved here? Well, because we use our experiences of what we think we see based on all the other times we've seen ducks and all the other times we've seen rabbits. So we take all of that information and we think about it and we look at the shape and the size compared to the space around the rabbit or the duck. We see the water for the duck and the grass for the rabbit and we start to give clues to ourselves and build upon that so that when we look in the center picture we see whichever one we were looking at more. Schema is the list of characteristics of an object or concept that allows us to categorize future unfamiliar information. It allows us to know the difference between objects, for example a chair versus a desk or a mother versus a father in a picture or a drawing, a child versus an adult through our experiences. A child's drawing of his dad and brothers indicates his perception and schema of the body being bigger than the legs because at this age, probably two or three years old, that's the way he sees the world. It influences how you will perceive future and unfamiliar information. Okay, so notice that the smiles are really big and giant. That means that this kid experiences the world as grown-ups being happy. Context effects. When we are given a stimulus, we can evoke radically different perceptions based on the immediate context of that stimuli. How would your parents respond to you if you were failing a course if you first tell them that you were arrested for robbing a bank? even though it's a lie. They'll probably perceive failing a grade in your class a little bit less harshly if you prime them with that of, oh my God, I did this horrible thing. I robbed a bank and I got caught or I shoplifted and they almost arrested me, right? Telling them about a bad grade is not gonna seem so, like such a big deal. Cultural context is when we are, the way we are because of the way that we were raised, the way that we were schooled and the way that we experience the world around us. For instance, in most Western cultures, it would be totally taboo to eat the animals that we usually have as pets, such as dogs, cats, and horses. But in many cultures across the world, it is totally normal to eat these animals. 
Your visceral reaction to this thought is made evident by the point that is now trying to be made. Cultural context is instilled by our culture and it alters our perception and our perception is our reality, okay? Then we have depth perception, okay? Depth perception enables us to judge distances. Gibson and Walk in 1960 suggested that human infants crawling age have depth perception and they put a baby on this with a glass right some kind of glass thing here so to show that even newborn animals show depth perception and know not to go over that cliff right that they could fall we know that there's glass there but the baby didn't know doesn't know or understand glass so the baby is going to stop at that ledge Monocular cues, okay, interpositions interposition, are objects that occlude or block other objects, right? So we understand things that tend to be perceived as closer when something is in the background or the foreground. You perceive the blue person to be up front because it blocks the person, the red person behind it. Okay, monocular cues also give us linear perspective like parallel lines, railroad tracks appear to converge and come together when they appear far off in the distance. The more the lines converge, the greater they perceive distances. We also have monocular cues such as relative size. Okay, if two objects are similar in size, we perceive one that creates a smaller retinal image as being further away. You perceive the pencil here as farther away because it's smaller in terms of being next to the one that seems closer, but in actuality, they're both right next to each other. We also have texture gradient, right? Indistinct fine texture signals increase with distance. So you perceive the paver tiles that are smaller as being further away on, these, on the cement down here, right? Because there's more texture. Right? We see the stuff that's right in front of us up close and it seems like there's lots of bricks. So the ones that we can't see seem further away. Okay, and next up is convergence. Okay, convergence are when two eyes move inwards towards the nose to see near objects and outward and away from the nose to see far away objects. Okay, the object is perceived as closer the more the eyes turn inwards. Just try it out yourself, you'll see what I mean. Okay, so if you're looking at a flower in front of you, you're gonna look down at the tip of your nose the closer that it is, right? If it's further away, you're gonna look upwards and out. Okay, and our last concept is retinal disparity. Okay, retinal disparity is when the images from two eyes differ. Okay, the greater the difference is between the two objects, the closer the objects are. So if you see in this image here, try looking at your two fingers half an inch apart, about five inches away from your face. Okay, you will see a finger sausage as shown in the diagram with the trees. Okay, check it out. This goes along with what I did on station four, I believe, with the things on the board where you went one inch away to try to read the big letters and then seven feet away to try to read the tiny little letters. Okay, so retinal disparity is the concept that you would be using to um, make out those different types of sizes of things as you're looking at them. Alrighty, that's all I have for you today. So I hope you enjoyed part two of Sensation and Perception, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great night. Bye-bye.